Welcome to a Rice University podcast. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, I'm Susan McIntosh. I'm director of Ciencia, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this initial colloquium in our year-long centennial-themed series on rice, a century of change. Although centennials are uh, most often celebrations of a history of accomplishments that revisit great moments and great people in that history, we've fashioned our theme this year in such a way that either a backward or a forward look at the changing face of our intellectual projects is possible. And sometimes both will be incorporated in the same colloquium. Panels from the social sciences in October and from chemistry and engineering in November will highlight the discoveries and high impact research that influence the development of programs and departments at Rice. And they'll also consider how we may be positioned for further developments in coming years. In looking back, we're reminded that our path to becoming a great research university has always depended on the faculty's commitment to outstanding research and scholarship and the vision and support of the leaders who made facilitating and growing that intellectual enterprise a priority. Major decisions as a consequence of that priority, to create a school of social sciences, to build professional schools, to develop institutes as a way to build research programs, have shaped our trajectory in important ways. Looking ahead to the future, all of these elements will continue to play decisive roles in what Rice will become. Our centennial arrives at a time of both change and challenge in higher education generally, with trends in research funding, technology, and globalization moving exceptionally rapidly. Thoughtful contemplation of what our university will become under such circumstances is essential, and this important project will usefully be informed by a look back at how, in previous times of change, we engaged the idea of what our university was going to be. And that, of course, brings us to our topic for today's talk, and our speaker is surely known to everyone here. She is our centennial historian and the person who absolutely loves it when you clean out your office and you don't trash your files, but you call her and ask her if she would like them. Melissa Kane is an authority on Rice's past. She has written short histories of Rice's School of Continuing Studies and the Jesse H. Jones Graduate School of Management. Her five degrees include foreign history, a Rice doctorate, a master's degree from Rice, and a master's degree from Crichton, and a BA from Iowa State. Her fifth degree is a JD from the University of Iowa. In 2000, she won Rice's John W. Gardner Award for Best Dissertation in the Schools of Humanities and Social Sciences. Her book, The Desegregation of Private Universities in the South, Duke, Emory, Rice, Tulane, and Vanderbilt, was published by LSU Press. Her ongoing projects include a history of Rice University and a study of the collapse of social regulation on southern campuses in the 1960s. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Kane speaking on Rice's Masterson crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it when someone comes. Um, when Susan asked me if I wanted to, well, she didn't really ask me if I wanted to talk. She sort of told me I was going to talk uh, this fall. Um, but she did very graciously uh, tell me that I could talk about whatever I wanted. And I immediately knew what I was going to talk about. And it was the Masterson crisis. There are several reasons why I wanted to talk about this. First, because it's such a good story that it practically tells itself. Second, I'd been thinking about it already for 20 years. Uh, so I didn't have to do a lot of new research. Although, you know, in the way of these things, I learned something new two weeks ago from Ralph O'Connor, who was actually on the board of trustees at the time of the crisis. So, you know, bear this in mind. If you know something about this that I don't, I, I, I want to hear about it. Um, but the real, the real reason I wanted to talk about it is because, well, in the first place, we never talk about it. 
You know, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of uh, always been kept, this sort of conflict at Rice has always been sort of kept undercover, not undercover really, but just we just, we don't, we don't discuss it. Um, and I think the reason that we don't discuss it is because it actually reflects real differences of opinion that are fundamental about what the nature of the institution is and what, it's, what it ought to be. That is to say that there, there are real fault lines that are usually covered up about what's our mission. What is it we're trying to accomplish here? Um, so to talk about this, I need, to, I need to go back very quick. Now I'm gonna try to do this in as linear a fashion as possible, which for those of you who know me know is not easy. Um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures of people and I could tell you hair raising stories about all these people, but I'm not going to do that here because today I'm talking about the Masterson crisis. So you'll only have your hair raised about that. Um, uh, so I'm going to go as quickly and as linearly as, as I can through this and highlight several, several themes about, you know, what is it we're trying to accomplish. So just by way of, just in the briefest giving of context, you know, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. So, you know, Edgar O'Dell Lovett is, provides the founding vision for this institution. And it is a vision of a total university, a complete research university. Gets off to a good start with the sciences and engineering. Not so good, perhaps, in the humanities. There really are no social sciences to speak of at the beginning. But we have financial problems, and things sort of begin to slow down. There's a world war. There's a depression. There's another world war. So the vision is not realized. Second president is hired, and that's William Houston who um, certainly knew, he came from Caltech, he was a physicist and a very eminent one, certainly knew what a first-rate research university was supposed to look like, but also never, for a variety of reasons, which we could talk about another time, never really got, uh, never really got a lot of traction. We certainly got better. Um, we certainly got more graduate programs, but it never even approached what it was supposed to be. So. In 1960, Housen had a heart attack, which didn't really debilitate him, but prevented him from uh, you know, fulfilling his duties as president. At that point, George R. Brown um, is chairman of the board. And George R. Brown is phenomenally uh, sophisticated. He's the wealthiest person we've had on the board in ages. He's politically connected, and he is deeply ambitious for this institution. Um, so he goes out and intentionally recruits Kenneth Pitzer, um, a Berkeley chemist who was also, uh, had worked for the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, an eminent chemist again, just as Housen had been in physics, and uh, very connected in Washington and um, with the support of Brown, who's here, um, they transformed the institution in a very short period of time. It went from being, um, you know, sleepy's not right, but it was definitely out of the mainstream. And, uh, you know, we had fine faculty, but there weren't enough of them. We had excellent undergraduates, but there weren't very many of them. Um, we didn't have uh, very much federal funding. Uh, there was not much emphasis on research, not much emphasis on graduate programs, and that all simply exploded. Within a period of about eight years, the student body doubled from roughly 1,000 to roughly 2,000. Uh, and in tandem with it, the size of the faculty roughly doubled, all the way to 250 by the time Pitzer left in 1968. Um, our research budgets went through, the, went through the ceiling. I mean, it was just, uh, this was the period when NASA was coming here, when uh, we went through the desegregation fight. Um, there was money coming in from other, uh, from the NSF, from, you know, other institutions in the federal government. And, you know, it really was just a fundamental transformation. 
Um, buildings began to be built again after a long hiatus. The research wing of the libraries added. Um, all that really the NASA stuff really was just, uh, you know, it, it, it was like someone came and flung a window open. It was, it was a fundamental transformation. It turned Rice into the modern university that we know today, in, in essence. Well, so what could be wrong, you say? <laughs> what could be wrong here? Well, you know, George Brown was so powerful that in some respects, he was almost a board of one. He had close allies on the board. Newton Razor, for example, for whom Razor Hall is named, uh, Bill Kirkland, um, who also shared this very expansive vision of, of you know, the, the kind of national, nationally important university that Rice should be. But Brown's very dominance of the board actually hid some problems under there. There was disagreement about whether or not this was the direction that the institution ought to be going. There were still people there who thought that, well, Pitzer himself, um, I'm looking at Bob Curl there. Bob Curl once told me that uh, Pitzer had a charisma problem. Um, <laughs> and I say to you, my friends, if Bob Curl knows that you have a charisma problem, <laughs> I say this with all affection. You've really got a charisma problem. Um, he, was, he was really smart. Pitzer was smarter than everybody else. He really was, actually. When you go through his papers, it just shines out at you, the clarity of his thought. And he wasn't, he wasn't uh, good at hiding that. He was a terrible public speaker. He could be quite abrupt with people. Um, there, were, he had, there were definitely issues, and this did not go over very well with a very genteel rice board um, that was still comprised mostly of local guys um, who had known each other since childhood, had grown up together in upper class Houston families. Um, so there was that problem, and then there was, again, the fundamental problem that they were not fundamentally committed to the vision of, of Rice as a nationally important research institution. And it felt, uh, on the other hand, that it, it ought to have more focus on quality of life and nurturing undergrads. Not that there should be no research or no graduate programs, but that they should be secondary. And we should basically tolerate them um, because it kept a good faculty in place to take care of the undergrads. Um, well. So there's trouble, right? There also begins to be a certain amount of financial trouble. Um, by the late 60s, the federal research funding for uh, higher education had peaked. NASA's highest budget ever was in 1967, and then it began a slow decline. The, the problems of the Vietnam War, the student movement, there was sort of a, the beginning of a, a disintegration of the post-World War II consensus about the proper relationship between the federal government and university research. So there was a period of declining revenues and some amount of political turmoil. So in the middle of all this, um, George Brown turns 70 in the summer of 1968. And this is when the Masterson crisis actually begins. Um, Ironically, it was George Brown who insisted that the board adopt a retirement age. Um, when he came on the board many years ago, it was still dominated by guys who were in their 80s. And were just he perceived that they were you know, cut off from campus, didn't understand what was going on. And so he insisted that there be a retirement age. And there was some debate back and forth about whether it should be age 70 or age 72. And if they had chosen 72, this never would have happened. Um, because when Brown goes off the board, he is replaced by this guy, who is um, Malcolm Lovett, the son of Edgar O'Dell Lovett, our first president. Um, I just found this picture today, by the way. And I bet anything, I know exactly what he's saying there. Um, 
his father was famous for having walked to campus every day carrying his books on a strap. And that's, that's, gotta, be, that's gotta be what he's talking about. So Malcolm Lovett essentially grew up here. He went to school here. He was Rice's first basketball hero um, back in, in uh, the late teens and early 20s. Um, he, he loved Rice. I mean, he, he identified with it in a really, really powerful way. And let me just quickly say this. All these guys on the board, they loved Rice so much. They had all had their lives totally transformed. This was back in the day when most of our students came from very poor backgrounds or middle class at the best. And um, they, were, they were unbelievably grateful. They, they had learned the skills they needed uh, to make successes of their lives. And they were trying to pay it back with sometimes decades of service on the board. They also gave huge amounts of money. It would be so easy if I could just tell you they were bad guys who did a bad thing, but they were not bad guys. They were good guys who were trying to do what was right. They just didn't know what that was. So he takes, a, he takes over from, from, uh, uh, from Brown in, in May of 1968, and uh, by August, Pitzer had resigned. Uh, he left to go to Stanford, um, which is part of the issue. Here's the Rice Board. I believe that this was actually taken on George Brown's last day. I can, you know, they didn't have their picture taken all the time. Uh, it was some kind of event, and I see and anyway, people who came on the board after he was gone. So this had to, this had to have been like the very, the very last day. Um, they, don't, they don't look like much fun, do they? <laughs> I, just, I just noticed that, actually. They don't, they don't look like much fun. Um, yeah, they were very serious, they were very serious men. Um, and here's another piece of context that you have to think about. All right, this is 1968. It's, it's the fall of 1968 when this all begins. They were extremely nervous, frightened, worried. Worried is probably the right word about you know, the eruption of student unrest all over the country. Um, they took it extremely seriously. As a matter of fact, the, the week before the Masterson crisis, they had tried to promulgate some, some regulations about student protests that were not well received. Um, they, were very, they were very minor, but they weren't, they weren't well, well received. So this is the context. I mean, when they're thinking about the campus right now, what they're thinking about is something like this. This happened at Cornell just weeks after the Masterson crisis. Um, and this is what they have in their minds when, when they're thinking about what could potentially happen on campus. And honestly, can you think of anything, frankly, more chilling to a trustee than something like that? Unless maybe it's this. Um, so they were, there, was a, there was a heightened sense of concern, right? They were worried about the money that Pitzer, they believed, had overspent. They believed that his plans, the 10-year plan it was called, was too ambitious. And there were stirrings. There was the beginning of an SDS chapter on campus. And so they're worried about finances, and they're worried about controlling the campus. And when Pitzer resigned, they immediately named a search committee, OK? Um, a search committee of the board. And, and it was relatively small. It had Malcolm Lovett at its head. And the two main people, who turned out to be the two main people, were two other trustees named Herbert Allen, for whom Allen Center is named, and Jim Teague. I'll get to them in a minute. But the other thing they did was they named uh, what they called a campus executive committee to take over the campus at the time. And that consisted of one of our heroes here, Bill Gordon who was then Dean of Science and Engineering. He was the sort of the chief executive officer of campus. They didn't call him interim president or acting president, but he was, that's effectively what he was. Um, also, Kerry Cronice, who had been, uh, uh, he was chancellor, and he was a geologist. 
Jim Sims from Civil Engineering, who was acting as what they then called Campus Business Manager, um, which is you know, essentially Vice President of Administration today. And um, Bill Tapazio, who was left in charge of the library. So basically, they, these guys had a meeting every week. Uh, uh, Gordon told them what their job was for the week. They came back and told him what they had done. And then they did the same thing over and over and over again. All they were doing was um, uh, the, cultural, the great cultural historian Jacques Barzin once said that the, function, the real function of a college president uh, is to make sure there's chalk in the classrooms. And that's what these guys were doing. They were making sure there was chalk in the classrooms. and they were trying to keep the 10-year plan from being crushed, right? Just in whatever small way they could, trying to keep the finances from being just slashed um, while they were there. So this is who's in charge of the campus. Um, when the board puts together its search committee, it also asks the faculty um, to put together a small advisory committee uh, to help them with the search. They did this on uh, the the search with, uh, with Houston, um, and they did it on the search with Pitzer. Very informally, but, but there was a group. This time it was a little more formal. They went out, the faculty, and they went out and elected uh, this, this advisory committee in essentially the same way that we do it now. Um, and when that committee began to meet, they went out and told the students, we want you to do the same. We want student representatives on this as well. Now, this is kind of an important thing because the students, first the faculty had to sell it to the students, right? The SDS is telling them, don't bother, right? They won't listen to you. Apathy is telling them, don't bother, they won't listen to you. So there was a bit of a sales job that went on here. We will listen to you, we will carry it to the board. Then the student leaders, the college presidents, the SA president had to go out and sell it too. So these people are hanging out there, right? And um, it doesn't turn out well. This turns out to be important. So here's who winds up on the faculty advisory committee. The chair is Franz Bratzen from Mechanical Engineering. And then there's Alan Chapman from Mechanical Engineering. Gaston Rimlinger, who looks like a happy fellow. I never met him. Um, he was chair of economics two or, two or three different times. Bill Cottle from architecture. And one of my other heroes, that's Zevi Salzberg from the chemistry department. Zevi Salzberg um, would turn out to be a really interesting character in all of this. Um, one of the things you need to know is that I know a lot about this episode. There is more evidence about this episode than anything else in the history of the institution. Um, I have got uh, the internal correspondence of the board. I've got uh, the papers of several trustees. I've got a journal that was kept by a faculty member in the classics department named Donald Levin, who kept the world's most boring journal. <laughs> 40 years worth of what I had for breakfast, what I listened to on the radio, what, what the students said in class, totally dysfunctional, except for this week, right? <laughs> It's like I know who he ran into on the sidewalk and what they said. It's unbelievable. He actually went back later and footnoted it. <laughs> he, he did. He footnoted it. And I also have roughly four or five dozen oral history interviews that were taken about five months after the events. So Harold Hyman was uh, really responsible for going out. Hi they hired an outside person to come and interview everyone. So I've got you know, I mean, accounts of this taken within six months of the events from, you know, 50 people. And they all say the same thing. Everyone gives you variations on the same, on the same thing, except for two or three people. And Zevi Salzberg is one of them. Zevi Salzberg came at this from a completely, a completely different angle. And he had a partner in crime who was not on the committee, but um, the two of them stuck pretty close together. Uh, and we're acting in, in independently of everyone else. This is Alex Dessler, who was uh, the chairman of space, uh, space physics at the time. So 
there's the committee, and they're supposed to be, you know, coming up with names and consulting all through the fall. But the, despite repeated attempts, they never met with the board. Uh, the board could never, they could never quite manage to get it arranged. Um, Malcolm Lovett had back problems, and he had had surgery and back problems all fall, and so he wasn't well. And and uh, they they uh, they tried to meet, tried to meet, tried to meet, and the board just never would meet with them. Finally, uh, the committee got together, threw five names down on a piece of paper, and sent it as a letter, which the board received on February 14th. Um, on February 21st, seven days later, still never having spoken to anyone on the committee, they appointed Bill Masterson as president of Rice University. Um, what to say? You know, I've said this before, and this is what I'm sticking to. There's two schools of thought about Bill Masterson. Um, the people were his, who are, were his friends um, tell me about a wonderful man who was kind and funny, self-deprecating, charming, generous. Um, and enough people tell me this that I, that I know it has to be true that he was that way at least sometimes. You know, I trust and respect the people who are telling me this, and uh, I know it must be so. Then there's a group of people who say exactly the opposite, um, that he was mean, he was petty, he was vindictive, he was sneaky. Um, and then there's a vast body in the middle. And that really was what's what swung things in, in a lot of ways. Most of them would say, and this is most of the testimony in all these interviews, is that I never had a problem with him, right? But I saw what he did to so-and-so, right? I heard what he said to this other person. So, you know, he had a reputation, at, at any rate, for being difficult. He was a Rice alum himself. Um, Shot in the history department for many years. Um, he was first master of Hansen. He was, uh, he became the first dean of humanities. He um, also was uh, assistant to, as President Houston there on the left. Don't know who the guy is on the right, but I bet you, I've seen so many of these pictures, I bet you $500 he'd just given him a check. <laughs> you know, I threw this in just for fun. That's Masterson making that face there at a history department picnic in about 1959. I think they were over in Herman Park. So you can see he's having fun there. Somebody likes him. All right. So they name him president, actually. Bill Gordon, who was the campus executive, they called him on Monday night and told him that, that uh, that they'd named Masterson president. Gordon had a 6.30 flight on Tuesday morning. He's gone, all right? The board was planning to announce the appointment to everyone, to the world, on Saturday afternoon. But word began to leak out. Now, one of the people who there's no picture of, but who, who was in the middle of all this, was a, uh, a guy named Lee Estes, who was the head of development and public relations. Um, now stop and let's think about something for a second. Bill, Bill Gordon is gone, right? We don't have a president. We don't have an acting president. Um, those other guys, I mean, they were running the library. They were making sure that the bills were paid. You know, the chairman of the board is in bed with back surgery. Who the hell is in charge? Who's in charge of this place, All right? The answer to this turns out to be very, very surprising. Um, but the board behaved as though Lee Estes were in charge. He's the PR guy, <laughs> right? To say that his conception of what was happening is askew would be an understatement. Um, he has, he, what he, I mean, he, he goes wrong from the first step he takes and then just gets wronger and wronger and wronger as he goes. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> word begins to leak out, and he hears about it, 
right? So he's communicating to the board, we have to do something we have to tell. He was very angry because he believed that Bill Gordon was the one who was leaking it. I don't, I don't believe that. I actually believe that, that um, it was coming from Chattanooga, where Masterson had been president of the University of Chattanooga. Um, uh, he also he left his papers there, which it took me 15 years to figure out. Um, so a lot of this is coming from there. Um, so, so it's coming from Chattanooga, but it's coming, right? Word is starting to filter through, and people are getting very alarmed. So Esther says, okay, you better, you better, uh, th this is Herb Allen, by the way. This is the, with, with Malcolm Lovett in bed, it's Herbert Allen, the vice chairman, who's left to be the public face of the board. Um, he says, you better come and meet with this faculty advisory committee. So uh, Herbert Allen, and um, his close friend on the board, a close friend in life, is Jim Teague. Um, Herbert Allen was a member of the class in 1929. He grew up, literally grew up in, a, in an East Texas sawmill camp. Um, he came to hold nearly 400 patents, member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, Jim Teague has a similar background, grew up in the West Columbia oil field and uh, went on to found his own very successful drilling company. Um, so they come and they meet with that, they meet with the faculty advisory committee. And it does not, it does not go well. Um, uh, you can just imagine. Um, Alan says, oh, I understand that, you know, we messed up, that we should have met with you, um, we meant to meet with you, but things just wouldn't work out. Um, but we got your names. We got the names in the letter. And we, we considered those names. We, oh, as a matter of fact, we, we, we already had some of those names on our own list. So why don't you guys just vote to approve what we did? <laughs> and um, here's where Franz Bratzen does his really, really good thing. Um, if he doesn't do this, again, none of this happens. Because honestly, I don't know how this vote would have come out. Um, because the students weren't voting. So we've got, we've got, I know that Bronson and Rimlinger would have been unalterably opposed. And I know that Caudill and Chapman would have voted for him. I don't know what Zevi Salzberg would have done. Um, I'm not, I don't think he would have voted for him, but I'm not sure. But. Bratson's refusal to have the vote, he just says, look, we weren't charged with approving what you do. We were charged with giving you advice. So we're not going to have a vote. And they don't. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it, never, it never happens. It's fantastic. Um, really, it was just a very, very, it was a very clever thing. So this happens on Thursday. By Friday, you know, everybody, everybody knows. And the most important person, really, in the whole thing is this guy right here. Um, when I said, who's in charge, it's him. Um, he was an undergraduate. He had just, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding, he was a genius. He, he was an undergraduate in Hanson College. Um, he had just been elected SA president. He was a junior college transfer from Minnesota. Um, he, w he spent the whole week, it was cold and rainy, uh, at least part of the time, wearing this ratty old hunting jacket. Um, and he, Friday morning, found out about this, and he was mad. He was really, really mad because he'd been hung out to dry, right? He had met, he had, when he became SA president, had gone to meet with Lovett, he'd gone to meet with Alan. They assured him, you know, that your input is welcome and wanted. And on their word, he went out and gave his word. And he is pissed. He is really, really mad. And immediately, right, unlike the faculty, right, he immediately begins figuring out what to do, right? What is the strategy? What are the tactics that we need? Because this guy is going down, right? Absolutely, he has no sense that it's not possible. 
right? No sense that the board will never give in, which the faculty did have. It's like, well, you know, I mean, we can, we can protest, but we're probably not going to win. No, 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 no. He didn't know that. Also, I would point out, uh, he didn't have a career. He didn't have a family. He didn't have a mortgage. Um, so, so he basically just, and in, in, I can't, I, I can't, he was a genius. Um, he, had, he had a way of, of feeling whoever he was talking to, like absolutely inhabiting them. So, so he knew so much about people. Um, and he just looked at the world in a different way. I mean, on Friday afternoon when the, the faculty met, it was terrible weather. It was pouring down rain. It was freezing cold. It was a bad storm. As a matter of fact, Bill Gordon was supposed to be running the faculty meeting but couldn't because his plane got diverted to Corpus Christi, which I know from Donald Levin's meticulous diary. <laughs> um, so everyone talks about the rain, the rain, the rain. It was raining, it was raining, it was cold, it was raining. Warren Skirin says there was a student meeting at the same moment, and he's, he says it was raining, which meant everyone had an umbrella. So the room was full of umbrellas. And you know that changes the way a room feels. You know, people are doing the things they do with umbrellas. They're shaking them out, and they're, they're unfurling them. And, and it was that kind of a room, right? Nobody else talks like that. No one talks like that. He was just really a really uh, intuitive and, and smart person. One more story about Warren Skarin. Um, he winds up in the movie business. Um, he, he was an extremely successful screenwriter and script doctor. I mean, Batman, Beetlejuice, Beverly Hills Cop, Officer and a Gentleman. But when he first went in the movie business on his own, he was working for an outfit that had just produced this really cheap thriller. And um, he, he contributed one thing. He said, this is a stupid name. And no one will come to see it with this stupid name. So we need to change the name of it to the Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> now, again, that is an insight into human nature that most academics are not capable of. <laughs> I mean that with all due respect. So by Friday morning, he's found out about it. Everybody's found out about it. Here's, like I said, the interesting thing really is that he goes and organizes, immediately begins organizing the students. The faculty are just sort of in a dither. And the whole thing, this, from now on, there's sort of this frenzy going on, right? People are just yappity, 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 talking, 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 constantly talking, and meeting and talking, and meeting and talking, and calling on the phone, and da, 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 you know. Uh, the one thing that I don't know is whether Bill Gordon was talking to Franz Bratzen, I don't know. Um, I would bet he was, but I'm not sure. Um, so the only thing that, and this turns out to actually be fairly pivotal as well, is the, the, um, a bunch of faculty members, mostly in the history department, you know, say, we got to do something, we got to do something. So they draft a petition. The petition says essentially two things. One, we, we vigorously protest the procedure that was used to select uh, Masterson. And number two, we want a reconsideration. Um, and in an hour, that was like roughly 3, three o'clock, and the, the faculty meeting was going to be at 4, because Bratzen insisted you have to tell the faculty before you hold a press conference, unless you really want the place to go up in flames. So in an hour, they got 61 signatures on this petition. Go into the faculty meeting, and I've got pictures of the faculty meeting. That's. Chancellor Cronice up there, who's running the meeting because Bill Gordon's plane got diverted to Corpus Christi. Um, the other guy next to him there, anybody know who that is? Thomas. 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 Oh, J.D. Thomas. Thomas. That's J.D. Thomas. Well, I'll be damned. He was, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, he kept the funniest meeting minutes I have ever seen in my life. Um, he was very funny. Uh, so he's the, he's the secretary to, to the faculty here. Um, Cronice gets up and starts the meeting. And there's the room. It was in the chemistry, it was in the chemistry lecture hall. I see several people in there that I know, including a couple who are in here right now. There's Herb Allen. You can kind of see in his face. <laughs> you can kind of see in his face. 
And again, he does the same thing that he did when he met with the faculty advisory committee. He says, look, Masterson's a great guy. He's a Rice alum. We can finally pick one of our own. Um, he's a scholar, which is, you know, sort of. He, he, um, he's a good administrator, which actually, he was a very good president at Chattanooga. Um, and, and he's one of our own. He's known in the community. He's from one of the old families. And, and um, we're sorry that we didn't consult with you. We know we screwed up. But again, he says, um, we saw your names. We looked at your names. And we already knew those names. Um, so we're sorry, but you know, we heard your advice. Well, the problem with this is it's not true. Um, this is something, again, it took me 16, 17 years to figure out because of Masterson stuff. They had actually offered him the job, uh, you know, 10 days before they ever got the letter, and he'd accepted it the same day. So, um, you know, he probably shouldn't have done that. Um, for a long time, I kind of felt bad for him because I thought, you know, in that room with all those wet, angry people, you know, I might have said the same thing. Um, but they'd actually planned it. Um, they had anticipated that there was going to be some opposition. They did not anticipate um, what was going to happen. So he gets up and says that. And then uh, Bratson is asked to get up and say what happened with the faculty advisory committee. And so he stands up, and he very calmly just says, here's what happened. Here's what didn't happen. Now, Lee Estes, the public relations guy, said that he thought, he thought that uh, Franz Bratzen was the uh, sneakiest political manipulator he had ever laid eyes on. Coming from a PR guy, that's, you know, <laughs> that's really quite a compliment. Um, and he said the way he does it is, the way he does it is, he creates the impression that he's not trying to create any impression. And I think that's exactly what he did. He just you know, stepped up, here's, here's, here's the facts. Um, so he gets through it. And then Holmes Richter stands up. Holmes Richter is Rice class of 26. He was the dean. He was in the chemistry department. And traditionally, he was the one who asked for adjournment. But he stood up, and he immediately asked for adjournment. And uh, then something happened that would also have a profound effect on the board, and that is people started clamoring, booing, hissing, yelling, no, you know, we're not finished. That really that shook them up. Um, but Cronice doesn't adjourn the meeting. And instead what happens is Jack Ward from the English department stands up with the petition. He reads the petition. and um, uh, it gets formulated into, into uh, a motion, right? Um, and and Cronice does a thing that turns out to be a, a blunder, just one of those just terrible blunders. And he says, well, um, read the names on the petition. Um, he, you know, thinking, I suppose, that it would be intimidating or that the names would be people who were marginal. Well, um, Alan Grobe loved to tell the story that the first name on the list was Jean-Claude de Bremacher, who <laughs> was considered to be a troublemaker of the highest order. And so Ward skipped over his name and went right to the next one, which was Zevi Salzberg, who was one of the most respected people on campus. They read through the names, and it is, you know, big dogs. Uh, not what Cronice was, was expecting. Um, so there's a little bit of debate about whether to split it into two motions or not. But in the end, what happens is the faculty votes overwhelmingly in favor of both parts of the petition, right? That we disapprove of the procedure that we used, and we demand a reconsideration. They come out. The students who had had their own meeting in the physics amphitheater are gathered out there. It's finally stopped raining. They're waiting for the faculty to come out. They hear what the faculty has done, and they're cheering them as they come out. And Warren Scarron says in his interview, just imagine what that would look like if you were in a helicopter up on top, right? So they split open and the faculty comes through. And you know, I mean, uh, he was really quite a fellow. So that's Friday. 
right? Everybody goes off, they go home, and again, they're buzzing, the phone lines are, are burning up, and there's meetings in the colleges. Every night there's meetings in the colleges. The students are all excited. Um, they don't know anything about Masterson, right? But they know all about how the procedure was bad. And that's really what they're focused on. And there's all, you know, faculty are going around and meeting in all the colleges and giving little stump speeches. Alan Grobe is, you know, got a barn burner that he gives them. And, and the theme all the way through is that the board has one idea of what they want to turn this university back to, right? And the faculty, which you'll remember, has doubled in Pitzer's tenure. Right? So half the faculty has been hired by the guy who the board just put out. They have another idea right, about what the university is going to be. And this, I mean, it's very exciting. And some interesting things happened. Um, this is really the birth of the radio station. Um, it had just started up, and its initials were still KOWL. Um, and it was tiny. It wouldn't go off campus. But it was really, it became like the, the information central so that uh, the TV stations and whatnot would send reporters over to sit in the parking lot uh, and, and turn on their car radios and, and um, this, is, this, is what's, this is what's going on. By Saturday morning, the students are so um, organized that they, have, they, have, they hold this huge like teach-in kind of thing in the gym which the athletic department has told them they could use. There's like 12, 1,300 students there. Um, and they vote on essentially the same, the, same two, the same two issues. And the vote is 951 to 7. Um, so we actually have tapes of this meeting, too. The radio station kept the tapes, and they're, they're in the archives. Um, again, the same thing, faculty members getting up and talking about you know, what is the, the direction of the institution? Clark Reed from the biology department asks the perennial question, right? Are we to be forever poised on the edge of greatness? Then they have a march. And this is, I just love this. They, they've decided in advance they're going to wear their coats and ties. And they've got their banners and their signs. And uh, the sun came out, right? You know, perfect. It was perfect. The sun comes out, and there, yeah. So they march from the gym, and they march to the, to the quad. At the same time this is happening, they're preparing for the, the press conference that was held in Cohen House. I find this a very evocative photograph. It's Masterson and his wife, who by this time was already a basket case. Very understandably. Very, very understandably. Um, and they, I mean, they see those kids out there, and they're getting ready to go in to this press conference. Press conference is fascinating, mostly because who wasn't there? I've looked very hard at these pictures and others, and there's nobody there. I mean, normally at things like this, people want to be associated. You know, they want to stand next to the new guy, you know, and be in the picture. There's no one there. Uh, but the press, and they tried very hard to, to round people up. Bratson wouldn't answer his phone for three days. Um, and there we have it. Um, this is really a preposterous performance, I'm afraid to tell you. Um, Alan introduces Masterson to the press, and uh, he says he regrets he regrets the unfortunate set of circumstances that has been created. No, no subject of the sentence. These circumstances have just been created. No idea how. Masterson clears this up when he starts talking. He says uh, that he regrets the unfortunate breakdown in communications that exists through the fault of no one in particular. <laughs> He says he'd like to meet with the faculty advisory committee and with the students himself. Um, and in the aftermath of the press, oh, here's his welcoming committee. Um, <laughs> so the students have gathered, they've gathered in the quad. Um, and Masterson actually comes out and talks to them. And this is what we have instead of the, instead of the assault weapons. Um, he comes out and he talks to them, and he, you can tell that is a man who your heart has to go out to him. That is, that's not a happy 
that is not a happy situation. Um, and again, it did not go well. The students, remember, don't know him. They don't know anything about him. They've got no professional jealousy with him. They've had no beef with him in the past. They don't know anything. And so this is their first real contact with him. And all he would say, and this was the board's strategy from start to finish, we have the right, the legal right, to appoint whoever we want. That's the only strategy they ever had. Um, they develop a strategy after this, um, which is to try to peel the students off from the faculty. Because one of the ways in which Warren Skarin demonstrates his brilliance is he's got lines open to the board. He's communicating with people on the board. And he has them completely convinced that he is on their side, that he's doing everything he can to keep these kids under control, that the faculty is leading them around by the nose, and um, uh, to keep them, keep them talking to him. He's, he's getting intelligence from custodians at various points. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely serious. Um, so uh, let me back up a little bit. So, uh, this doesn't go well, all right? So Masterson instead says, you know, let me meet with the students. He never agrees to meet with the faculty, never. So he has roughly a five-hour meeting with the, the college presidents, with Warren Skarin, with the kids who were on the, uh, the advisory committee, and it's, it's just a, it's a complete disaster, right? By the time they walk out of it, all he has done, he refuses to, do, to take any steps um, to, to address any concerns. It's just a mantra over and over again. You know, this is a legal matter between me and the board. There is nothing that could convince me not to take this position. I've already taken the position. I'm sorry that you don't like it. You're going to have to find a way to live with it. You know, and they tried and tried and tried to find something he could do um, that would give them confidence that he would, in fact, be a good president. And at the same time, this is where Salzburg and Dessler come in, right? They're the only faculty through the whole thing who ever, except for his friends who were trying to, who were trying to talk to him also, they're the only people who, who actually met with Masterson privately off campus in his hotel room. They called him on the phone repeatedly, essentially saying, can't you fix this? There are ways you can fix this, right? If you come and you say, look, I withdraw, but let's talk about Let's talk about it, right? What do I have to do? What could I do to begin repairing this breach and getting it put back together in a way that we can all move forward for Rice? And he just simply wouldn't do it. He, he, you know, and why would he not do it? You know, Salzburg talks about why he wouldn't do it. And, and partly, partly it's that I think the board told him not to. And they were, especially Malcolm Lovett, was his boyhood friend. And he wasn't going to go against them. Um, partly, he really, really wanted to be president, right? He really wanted that. He also loved Rice and thought he knew how to make it better. And just couldn't even let go for a minute, even if there was the prospect of getting it back in the end. So, you know, in the end, you know, he just, he just couldn't do it. And um, uh, the students came out of the meeting and sent out a press release, if you can imagine this situation. They sent out a press release saying, you know, now we're not just opposed to um, the procedure, we're also opposed to the person. Um, Sunday morning, uh, Gordon is finally back. He holds essentially office hours in which it is, it is um, decided to hold a poll of the faculty and the students, again with two issues. Do you approve or disapprove of the procedure? Do you do approve or disapprove of the person? And um, I've never seen the numbers. Um, Gordon and Skarin took the numbers uh, over to uh, Malcolm Lovett's house and told him what the numbers were. And uh, they must have been they must have been very, very bad indeed. Um, so that happened on Monday. The poll was on Monday. On Tuesday morning, Warren Skarin sends a message to Herbert Allen saying, if he doesn't resign, I can't keep the campus open. Um, Tuesday afternoon, he resigned. 
Um, so that's that, isn't it? So what it, Friday to Tuesday, essentially. Friday to Tuesday. So what, is, what, is, uh, what does this mean? <laughs> um, there, the people who were there have various assessments about even what were we fighting about, all right? To, to Gordon and the faculty, it was very clear in their minds. They were fighting for the future of Rice as a serious place of scholarship and research. To the board, I believe what they were fighting about was something different. They were no longer fighting about, oh, we want it to be more focused on undergrads. They still had in their minds, you know, those, those you know, the National Guard out on campus. They had in their minds, um, you know, unrest. And above all, they had in their minds a challenge to their own authority, both as, as people and as members of the Rice Board of Trustees. And so for them, it was always, always, always about we can't give in, we can't give in, we can't give in. It's our right to make this appointment. And they could not move past that, um, even though no one was denying that it was their right to make the appointment, except the SDS. I will, I will say that. The, the, those 14 people. Uh, denied that the board had the right to make that appointment. But everybody else was, was, you know, it's not that you don't have the right, it's that the way you're exercising your authority is so brittle and so fragile that it's going to crack, right? And, and it cannot help the institution if we don't have any agreement about who should lead us and where we're going. Um, so that's what, that's in, in essence there, that's what that's what I think is going on. There are some, there are, there are a couple other things. Um, I've got a couple of quotes here. Um, if you read my blog, anybody who reads my blog knows that one of these, this is a letter that Masterson wrote in the aftermath to Salzburg. Um, it actually caused me to get pulled over for speeding in Wallace, Texas. <laughs> this is the letter. <laughs> um, Salzburg had written him essentially saying, as a personal matter, I'm so sorry for what happened to you and what happened to your wife. Um, and Masterson writes him back and he says, you know, thank you very much for your kindness. You've been kind through the whole thing. But then, then he says uh, something that, you know, at first I thought it was just bratish. But I realized that, that that's not really right. Um, in the first place, he had every right to be angry. And I mean, he had actually, I believe, been led to believe that there would be some mild opposition, but nothing serious. Um, because I think that's what the board actually believed. Um, he had every right to be angry. And he also knew things that the faculty did not know. Um, and you can see that in what he says. It's just a, it's just a, a paragraph. He says, I would only remark that the danger of a breakdown in the relationship between Rice and the community that you speak of is not a future or a potential danger, but a long accomplished fact which has occurred during the last 10 years, as most of the Houston community knows. My appointment did not create this breakdown, and my withdrawal will not heal it. I hope that the university can somehow begin to bridge this gap, which will otherwise destroy it. What is he saying there? He's saying Pitzer. He's saying Pitzer was not liked and was divisive in the Rice community, or at least that segment of the Rice community that Masterson was friendly with, which segment, I would point out, wrote most of the checks. The dream that you have of a self-sufficient Harvard in South Texas, sufficiently wealthy and institutionally and intellectually independent of its surroundings, is only a pipe dream. Pitzer discovered this. That's why he left. But many at Rice still refuse to do so. Well, that's interesting. The other thing is Herbert Allen. In Herbert Allen's papers, which are extremely revealing, that's where most of the bo internal board correspondence is. After it was all over, Allen sat down and tried to 
make sense of what happened. He essentially wrote himself, handwritten, a memo to file. And uh, it, it's actually extremely touching. I mean, he was befuddled, uh, you know, as, as most of them were, just simply befuddled. Um, one of the things he said really kind of struck home and struck me also as a central point here. He said, it came as a shock to me to realize that the literally man years I have given Rice since 1949 were confined to the buildings, the grounds, the finances, the administration, and almost none to know and communicate with any faculty members. I know almost nothing about the academic life of the institution. You could feel it hurt him. You know, it, 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 it really hurt him. Um, so what we got here is we got um, the trustees know something the faculty don't know. And the faculty know something that the trustees don't know. And if only they would have used their advisory committee, right? <laughs> they, they uh, you know, they could have learned something and the whole thing been avoided, probably, probably. Um, that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I imagine there are going to be questions. We are ready for them. We have two microphone runners. Uh, put your hand up, Melissa. We'll call it. Well, we'll team. Yeah, we'll just tag team here. But we got to get a mic to you so that we can hear the question on the video. Okay, because this will be available on our website. All right. So. Tapia. <laughs> so I heard you say the board put Pitzer out. Now, to what extent did he resign? on his own, to what extent, with a push from the board, to what extent. So I want to know why exactly more about why Pitzer left. OK, it, it was probably half he was pushed and half he jumped. Um, really, once George Brown was gone, I mean, there had been trouble rumbling um, uh, even before Brown was gone. Um, the, the, there were people on the rice board who were very uneasy with, with taking so much federal funding. Um, in, in particular, supporting salaries, uh, faculty salaries out of federal funding. And they had been pushing on him and pushing on him and pushing on him. And that was the only way he knew, right? I mean, that was, th that was what had made possible the, the huge you know, leap forward that we took when he was president was federal funding. I mean, he came with that. Yes, he came. He came that, that's what he was hired to do. Right? George Brown hired him to do that. Up until that point, we hadn't accepted a whole lot of federal funding um, on the theory that you know, who pays the piper calls the tune, which is correct. They're not wrong about that. Right? But, but um, uh, you know, George Brown, he, built, he made himself rich off federal funding. He wasn't going to you know, I mean, let, that, sit, let that, that pile of money sit when it could be used to improve the institution. But some of these other guys, they did not, they did, they were not uneasy with it, they were uncomfortable with it, and they didn't like the changes that it brought to the institution. And he, he knew it, uh, he absolutely knew it. And it's not like he, I mean, he went to Stanford, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You also mentioned this 10-year plan. Uh, when was it generated and who authored it? Uh, the 10-year plan was generated in 1962. Um, it was the work of a lot of different people. Um, Carrie Cronice, uh, did, uh, who was the, the chancellor at the time, um, and had been at Rice since the mid-50s. He, he was actually president of Beloit College before he came here. He was a very able guy. Um, he, did a lot of the, he did a lot of the analytical work. Uh, the projections, the budget projections, and enrollment projections, and stuff like that. It was very ambitious. I mean, I mean, uh, it anticipated, you know, another doubling of enrollment, another doubling of the faculty. Maybe not in 10 years, but within 15, uh, 10 residential colleges. Um, you know, it was very, very ambitious, and it also anticipated that there would be years of deficit budgets, which in fact there were, 
which is partly what got the boards, you know, boards don't like that, right? I, I'm a trustee myself at another institution, and we don't like that. Um, so, so, I mean, they were, to say that they were nervous without reason would be completely wrong. Um, Cronice hated Pitzer, by the way. He hated him. Um, uh, but he, 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 served him, he served him very well. Did the plan anticipate the charging of tuition? Yes. It anticipated the charging of tuition, and it also included our first capital campaign, right? $33 million campaign that actually raised $43 million in, in like two years less than it, was, than it was meant to. Anybody else? Nobody? Nobody wants to argue with me? <laughs> Oh, there's. Yeah, just uh, reflecting on kind of a larger perspective that you know no historical event kind of is a, occurs in a microcosm. Right. That it occurs in a larger social and political context, and so we look at what was going on in the '60s in this country with the protests and for civil rights, assassination of political leaders, you know, the protests against the war. And now we put rice in that context, you know, being in Texas in the 60s, the kids were not, it wasn't where kids were burning their draft cards. Right. Uh, I was, I'm not aware that it was where people were, students were marching for civil rights either. But yet that larger issues in society were, were there. And to what extent did the passion of everybody, particularly the students in the masses in this affair, kind of become a reflection of the fact that this was their outlet. Right. You know, in the 60s, the kids wouldn't burn their draft cards in, in, in this part of the country. So to what extent do you feel yeah. that could be a No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, they, that was never going to happen here, right? We were never going to have the National Guard on this campus. We were never going to have armed militants on this campus. We had, a, you know, a, a few sporadic minor events. Um, uh, but, I mean, you're exactly right. Part of the reason that Warren Skarin was able to, uh, you know, get, it, get it, the fuse lit so quick is because they were itching for something to protest. <laughs> you know, something to protest. You know, they didn't want any real trouble, you know, but, but they, they wanted something to protest. And to their great credit, um, when the students got their teeth into this, they really wanted to learn about what is it that a university is? What is it that it's supposed to be? What's its function supposed to be? What is our mission? What should our relationship with the faculty be? They were really, really eager to learn and, and participate in, in the most, um, uh, the most you know, functional way that they could. Right? They didn't want to burn anything. They just, they wanted to be part of it. Again, the irony here is if you would have just used the committee, um, you know, that, then that would have been, that would have been harnessed on, in, in the service of the board. You know, it's just, I don't know, it was, it was a real shame, really. Nancy, somebody running. I have no idea. Never seen them. Never seen the five names. I've never seen that letter. There's still stuff floating around, so if you have it, if anyone has it. <laughs> <coughs> right here. Uh, Caleb, right here. Governor Hobby. Oh, 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 Melissa, as you've pointed out, uh, George Brown dragged Rice kicking and screaming into the 20th century. Yes, sir. And, uh, and, and made a research university uh, uh, out of it, which it was not before. Uh, you can't have a research university without federal funds. Uh, you can't have federal funds if you're segregated. Right. So it was George Brown, basically, that, that integrated Rice, and, and that's, that, that's another, but that, that's a very important part of this whole thread that you're talking about. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, and this, this goes back to, you know, my, my work is in the, the history of desegregation in, in, in our peer institutions as well. And Rice is really unusual among them. 
because at all these other schools, at Duke, at Vanderbilt, at Emory, there, there were extended internal arguments on the boards about, about desegregation. There was no such thing at Rice. It was George Brown. We weren't going to get the NASA money if we didn't desegregate. And George Brown said, we were getting the NASA money, so we're going to desegregate. <laughs> and, and there was some token resistance, you know, but it was in the nature of, um, it was in the nature of, well, I don't like this, George. Uh, <laughs> I wish you weren't making us do this, George. Um, but he, he did, in fact, make them do it. He just made them do it. Um, um, but that's part, that is part of the, the whole thing. You know, it had brought all kinds of change all at once, very fast, to a campus that really had, had changed very slowly um, in, in you know, the period from r roughly you know, the 1930s through 1960. And it was bang, just pop. It was awesome. Uh, okay. Get behind you, Caleb. Um, so after this occurred, what was the process the board then followed going forward to uh, avoid having you know a, a rerun of the of the same problem? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, the, the, the instantaneous process was we're dis we dissolved everything, right? We dissolved the old faculty advisory committee. We dissolved the campus executive, put Frank Vandiver in as, uh, as acting president because they realized quickly that Bill Gordon had authorized that poll, and so out he went. Um, really, it was a very brave thing he did. Um, but. Then they immediately said, all right, we're going to reconstitute the board search committee. And we're going to ask the faculty to put together another advisory committee. And now, though, we have, we've got two things that are different. One is um, the board was talking to that faculty advisory committee all the time. Um, the other thing that's different, of course, is that nobody wants a job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they had a, they had, it was an extended, extended process to, to find someone um, who, who, who would take the job. And it was, in fact, uh, the faculty advisory committee that produced the name of Norman Hackerman um, on the theory that, he, you know, Norman was then president of the University of Texas. And he was, he was in uh, such misery there. Uh, <laughs> the chairman of the regents had moved a second desk into Norman's office. And um, they, they figured, you know what, he'll take the job. And, and he did. Um, so that, that name came up from the faculty. And also, I, I have to say that, uh, that, you know, I have a certain amount of sympathy for Masterson. You could probably, you could probably tell. Um, but I think that in the, in the end, we, we were much better off with Norman, Norman Hackerman. Um, he was just far more sophisticated about the national uh, research machinery and, and you know, very well regarded nationally in his own field. Um, and and um, you know, he, he also, I believe, was capable of something that Masterson probably was not capable of. And that is he could argue with the board. Now, don't, don't mistake me. He never got into a knock, knockdown drag out with the board, or, nor would he ever have done so. Um, but he would tell them, well, you know, um, of, course, of course we're all trying to reach the same goal here. And, and I'm totally in agreement with you fellas. But you know, maybe it would be better if we did it this way instead of doing it that way. And, and so, I mean, you see, it took me, again, this is one of those things that, you know, 15 years in the same archives, you begin to see nuance that you might not have seen if you'd only read it once. You can see him trying to kind of maneuver the board in various ways o over time. And I don't believe that, I don't believe that Masterson would have done that. Um, so in the, in the end, it, you know, it's, it, we're probably slightly better off. Hmm. Norman? Yeah. Yeah, no, he, 
he, he, he, you know, it, it could have been worse. <laughs> I was very fond of Norman, by the, by the way. Uh, he, and he always insisted um, that, that um, the rice board, and this would tell you something about what they would have told Masterson, okay, that, that the rice board gave him two instructions. One was don't ever overspend your budget, which, you know, every year he got a budget of X million and spent X minus one million. And we don't want any trouble from the hippies. <laughs> and that's what he did for 15 years. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I want to, you know, on behalf of us all, thank Melissa for a fantastic talk, great insights into a uh, obscure, uh, but, but famous, at the same time, uh, episode in our history uh, that has certain uh, contemporary resonance and certainly is a cautionary tale for any of us involved in the ideal of shared governance, um, as many of us are here, and uh, of course I am uh, uh, on the hot seat at, at the moment as Speaker of Faculty Senate. So uh, I have learned a great deal and uh, we'll take those lessons to heart. Thank you all very much for coming. I hope you'll join us at a reception outside and continue the conversation. Appreciate it. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.